In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of a natural descent, or of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son came from the Father. Full of grace and truth. I'd like to say a huge Christmas welcome to everybody watching this service, brought to you by the Born Christian Centre from the homes of many from our congregation. And we hope that you'll find moments of laughter, joy and reflection as you journey with us through the infamous Christmas story and the many carols that we're going to sing together and much, much more. I'm going to say a quick prayer before we have our first opportunity to raise our voices and join together in singing a couple of Christmas carols brought to us firstly from the Pike household and then the Meagre household. Father God, we lift this Christmas time before you. We ask you to grace us with your incredible presence in our homes as we know we're joined together watching this service this morning. Would you bless all those who listen, Lord, and fill our hearts with joy 
as we enjoy your presence together. Amen. to sing and now we're going to move into another time in our service where we're going to listen to the children of the Bourne Christian Centre reading the whole Christmas story taken from the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. I hope you enjoy it. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius 
was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Gal Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to med register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, Messiah of the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth peace to everyone whose favour rests on. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the things that has happened which the Lord has told us about. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And, and all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel, the angel had given him before he was conceived. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We, stopped, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them when the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will become a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Hebrew, they returned to their country by another route.
really is nothing like singing Christmas carols at Christmas. Didn't you just really enjoy that one? And then hearing the Bible story of the whole of Jesus' birth being read to us by our children, and so beautifully as well. But we're going to move on now, as we've got a real surprise for you in store. We have the children presenting the Christmas Nativity Play, a very, very current and modern version of the Nativity, with proper social distancing going on and all of the COVID guidelines being adhered to to the nth degree. I think you're going to find this really fun. Um, so just sit back and enjoy the play. Here we go. Over to you, kids. Okay. Scene one, a shock for Joseph. Hi, Joseph. I got some really exciting news. Are you sitting down? Because it's quite shocking. Yes, I'm sitting down. What is it? Have you got me a new puppy for Christmas? No, Joseph. I'm pregnant. What? How can this happen? We've been in lockdown for the past six months. I didn't realise unicorns could do this sort of thing. Joseph, this might sound a little strange, but let me explain. I was asleep last night and an angel appeared to me and told me that God's Holy Spirit would put a baby inside me. He said the baby would be holy and would be called the Son of God. Joseph, I'm having God's baby. This is absolutely crazy. What will people think of us? I'm not sure what to say, Mary. Let me think about it. That night, while Joseph was asleep, an angel came to him in a dream and said, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The baby inside her is from the Holy Spirit. He will be called Jesus and he will save people from their sins. So Joseph did as the angel said and took Mary as his wife. Scene two, arriving in Bethlehem. Awkward! Very near the time Mary was expecting her baby, the happy couple had to travel to Bethlehem to be counted in the census as Joseph came from that region. I'm so tired, Joseph. Just knock on this door. Look, the lights are on. Can I help you? Yeah, we really need somewhere to stay the night. My wife's about to have a baby. What tier is your region in? We're in tier three where we come from. Is that a problem? Yes, you must keep up with the news. We're in tier two here and the tiers aren't allowed to mix. Now go back where you came from. Oh, how did we miss that one? It's so hard to keep up with the rules nowadays. Let's try another house. Let's try this one. Hello, can I help you? Yes, please. I really need someone to stay tonight. I think I'm going to have a baby. Uh, oh no, uh, well obviously you can't come inside because we're only allowed to go near one person outside. Or is it inside? No, you can get, you can go no one inside but you can meet up with people for a walk outside. Do you want to go to walk so we can talk about it? No, I've just walked a hundred miles. Are you sure we, you don't have anywhere we could stay? Okay, I can see you're really desperate but I can't let you in so you'll have to stay in my garden shed. Oh, in three days you're allowed to mix with two other households, but only for the following five days. Here's some spare mess in case you have any visitors. Thank you. I can't tell you how grateful we are for your kindness. That's okay. I'm not even going to ask what tier you're supposed to be in. Scene three. Having a baby in lockdown. Well, isn't this in my shed? I couldn't think of many worse places, but if you say so. Oh, Joseph, the baby's coming. Just until the hospital 
are broke up by COVID cases. I think I'm going to have to deliver the baby. What it looks like, Joseph, is we're going to have to trust God to deliver his own son. I think you're right, Mary. Lord, help us! Beautiful Joseph. Wow, that was quick. We better find somewhere for it to lie down. Let me have a look. Socially distancing shepherds. In some fields nearby, there are some shepherds feeding their sheep. When suddenly a whole host of angels appeared to them and said, Do not be afraid. I bring good news to you. This will cause joy to all of the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a, mess, a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths in someone's garden shed. Now hurry along and don't forget your masks. When the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Come on guys, let's go to Bethlehem and find this baby that the angels told us about. Hello, anyone in there? Hi, don't come in. I don't believe we're allowed to have visitors until the 23rd. I'll bring the baby out to you. We love to see him. Someone told us he's the son of God and will stay two meters away. Here he is. He really is the son of God. Can I hold him? Here you are. Never mind, it looks like you'll have to keep him. The glory shining from his, him is enough for us anyway. Scene five, the king's arrival. Finally. Hello, sorry we were a bit late. The latest advice was not to drive anywhere, unless it's an essential journey, but to ride bikes or walk. So it took a few months longer than expected. Anyway, we are here now and we are so excited to see the new born king. We saw the new star in the sky and knew we had to come. We brought gifts of gold. Frankincense. And love. Thanks so much. I feel so blessed to be holding this holy child. Wow, he really is the son of God, king of all the Jews. And from that time onwards, people from all over the world have come to know Jesus as their king and their saviour. Even today, with the worries of the coronavirus, we can find a renewed sense of joy in the gifts of faith, hope and love that are freely given to us when we put our trust in Jesus. Well, thank you so much for that nativity play, kids. It was absolutely fantastic. I really appreciated all the effort that you put into that as well. I hope it put a smile on your faces like it did on mine. And hopefully it brought about a new appreciation for the troublesome times that we're all going through around the world together at the moment. We're going to move now into having a really traditional Christmas carol uh, at the Finlayson house before we move on to a craft activity. Uh, with Julia. So for the craft activity you'll need a pair of scissors, some sellotape or glue 
and some coloured card, any amount of coloured card. And or, or if you did receive the printout from Julia, uh, that will be absolutely fine. And after the craft activity, we're going to go over to the Mitchell household to sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, before we welcome John Steer, who's going to bring our Christmas message. <laughs> Welcome to this craft slot. This week we're going to make paper chains of the names of Jesus. You can either use plain paper or coloured paper or the printout that was emailed out to your parents. All you need to do is spend some time colouring in the different names of Jesus. So some of the examples that I put on the printout were Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Son of Man, Son of God. Those are just a few and you could spend some time looking through the Bible um, and seeing what names of Jesus you can find. Once they are all coloured in, you can decorate around the outside if you like. Um, and then you cut them out. And I suggest going around the outside first and then up the straight lines. After you have cut them all out, you can um, put a little bit of glue or you could use sellotape if that's what you've got available um, and start looping your paper chain together. And by the end of all that colouring and all that cutting and all that sticking, you should have a beautiful paper chain that you can put up somewhere in your house to display the names of Jesus as we remember him at this special time of year. I really hope you enjoy making your paper chains and I look forward to seeing some pictures that your parents can send through to me. Um, and let me see what they look like. Bye! <laughs>
its dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Good morning. Very happy Christmas indeed to each of you and especially perhaps to those who have joined us for the first time. Maybe you've been invited to join this Christmas service by people that you know in the church or maybe you've just stumbled across this on the web and are listening maybe to the first time uh, to something at Christmas about what Christianity and who Jesus really is. And you know I've got a very simple message for you this morning. And it's simply this, whatever background you're from, whatever you've done, you're welcome in the family of God. And the message that I have for you today is built around the story that I've been reading recently in Ruth and how it connects with the greater story in Matthew chapter one and illustrates where Jesus came from, his colourful history, if you like. And the fact that God is able to work through situations that sometimes seem dark or inconsistent. He's able to bring gold out of those. And like I said, the message is today simply this, that God is welcoming you into his family. Whatever your background, whatever your darkest secret, however great your shame or feeling like you don't belong. God is welcoming you and you just simply need to come and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. I've been thinking a little bit about the year we've been through and the easy thing to do would be to focus on the way that we've had to respond to COVID-19. Massive impact on our lives, the way we live, the way we go about our business. But one of the other great things that's happened this year, and maybe many of you have been following this, is the election. In America. You know, I've been thinking much about how truth is twisted and represented and digested and spun in so many different ways. And I think as we've watched the election process in America unfold, and indeed right up to it, we witness how perception of truth is challenged. Much has been talked about the impact of social media and the responsibilities that those companies need to bear upon making sure that what's available on their platforms is true and tested and not shown to be false. We're presented all the time with fake news and we're having to learn a new skill in society and that's to filter and to test and to evaluate and not just take it face value what we're told. But of course what you witness through the process of the election in America is a desire to control the narrative, to present a clear message. It might not necessarily relate to truth, it might just have shades of truth in it or perceptions or be about setting out a political message. And we've witnessed that to a great extent throughout that process 
in America during 2020. And we all react to narrative. You know, sometimes we choose a narrative that makes us feel particularly comfortable. And we see that in America. There are many um, the people that I talk to who find who have found Donald Trump an interesting character. You know, years ago, um, politicians were very much uh, desirous of getting into the center ground, the center ground of politics. It was a race to who could be the most central person in terms of ideology. But what we've seen um, in recent times is a much more polemic spread of politics. People sat on the right or sat on the left and no longer reaching for that center ground, but identifying at perhaps those extreme ends. Yeah. But sometimes what we hear is what makes us feel comfortable and we're prepared to run with it, particularly um, if it makes us feel like the decisions we're making or the way we're living life is justified by the narrative that is coming out of leadership. Perhaps one of the other responses we have is when we hear a narrative we don't like, we try and change it. I was thinking about the story in John 9 of the man born blind who Jesus heals. And the Pharisees just cannot understand this miracle. They wrestle with it. They challenge the man who's been uh, healed. They question him and they keep coming back for more. And in John 9, uh, they come back a second time and they say this, give glory to God by telling the truth. They said, we know that this man is a sinner. They don't like what Jesus has done. So they try and change the narrative by suggesting that Jesus himself is a sinner and corrupt. As you know, sometimes we dislike a narrative so much that we try and destroy it. Just recently, I've been reading through the story of the transition of power from Saul to David. And it's a fascinating story. We haven't got time to go into it, but you see gradually how Saul in 1 Samuel changes his position. He uh, clearly moves away from God and comes under evil influences. And his reaction to David's growing popularity is ultimately one which starts out with just keeping a close eye on David, but moves into a position where actually he wants to destroy him. We react to narrative. And I want to read to you a little bit of narrative, a little bit of story in Ruth chapter four. And it contains uh, genealogy, which I don't know about you, but when I read through the Bible as a kid, uh, and in my teenage years, and in fact, even now today, to be honest, when I read genealogies, it's not sort of a part of the Bible. I go, right, I want to spend hours looking at this. I just want to skip through and get to the get to the next section, the story, what happens next. But actually, if we look at genealogies, they are powerful. Because you see the characters involved and how, particularly in relation to what we're talking about this morning and the birth of Jesus, the colourful characters that exist in those genealogies tell their own story. A story that tells you and it tells me that we are welcome in the family of God despite our background and in spite of what we might have done. And I'm so grateful to God for that. Let me read to you just the short bit in Ruth chapter four. Again, no time to explain the story of Ruth. If you've not read it before, pick up your Bible and read it. It's only four chapters. It's a really short story, but just a little bit of background. Ruth was from a nation called Moab, not part of the family of God. And it's a story about he, how she comes to faith, how she comes to realise that the God of Israel can be her God also. And she ends up marrying this man called Boaz. Uh, and in verse 13 of chapter four, it says this. So Boaz took Ruth. And she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you uh, than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. 
This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David. A really short little bit of narrative, capturing also a genealogy that is echoed in the greater genealogy of Matthew chapter 1, which traces the heritage, the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. And part of the fascination here in this little, little section that we've read is that this lady Ruth has come into the family of God. It's important because it sets the record straight. There's no hiding her background. It's really off the surface in the story of Ruth. Her background is clear to all, clear for us to read as we look back through history. And it's interesting and important because in Deuteronomy 23, when God gives lots of laws and commandments to his people buried throughout the Old Testament, there's a little bit of history that raises a question mark about the whole story of Ruth. No one born of a forbidden marriage, nor any of his descendants, may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the 10th generation. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the 10th generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt, and they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor in Aram Naharim to pronounce a curse on you. So how does this all fit together? David's only three generations away from Ruth and she's a Moabitess. And yet we read in Deuteronomy a really clear instruction about the fact that the descendant must not enter the assembly of the Lord. There's maybe two or more possible explanations for this. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you probably believe that the restrictions on this Moabite lineage uh, and then becoming Israelites doesn't apply to female Moabites because it was only men who had originally refused to give food when the Israelites were passing through their land. There's another school of thought that believed that Ruth uh, was not actually a Moabite person, um, but was instead a, a descendant of, of, of Israel itself, living um, as a citizen in Moab. Do you know what? I'm just going to park those two ideas off and I'm not sure whether they hold water or not, but I'm just going to take the story at face value. As far as I'm concerned, Ruth found the God of Israel to be the true, living, righteous God. And she chose to make him her Lord. And in doing so, she came into the family of God. And God extended his grace to her. And she becomes one of those who, were for, who is part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ himself. I'm not going to worry about the detail, but what it shows to me is God's grace, that God is in the business of welcoming you and me, whatever your background and whatever you may have done. You know, the fascinating thing when you read through the story of Matthew chapter one, there's a number of ladies mentioned, Tamar, Ruth, as we've read about just now, another lady called Rahab, and another lady called Bathsheba. Ruth, a problem background, not part of the family of God of Israel, but became one. Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, ladies who had colourful sexual backgrounds. And yet, God chose them and refers to them in the genealogy of Jesus. I just want to encourage you this morning, when the Bible records things, when you come to passages like this in Ruth 4 and in Matthew 1, God is clear about the story. God is clear about who is welcoming into his kingdom and he's in the business of welcoming you. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you have done. He's extending his arms to you today through this little babe Jesus that we're celebrating at this Christmas time. And he wants to welcome you into 
the family of God. Do you know, I wrote this down and I think sometimes we, we miss the moment. We miss what God is doing. And it's so true throughout the whole of Bible. There is there's a fixation upon what man values. And actually, we need to have our eyesight adjusted and recognise what God is doing. Remember that statement, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The kingdom turns upside down all of man's preconceptions. And it's true of Jesus as well. You know, there's a verse in Isaiah 53 which says this. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. This is speaking about Jesus and like a root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This is the saviour of the world that is being referred to in Isaiah 53, not some beautified, westernised view of Jesus um, that we might hold. God choose to, chooses to work in the most lowliest and unloveliest of places, and he welcomes the most unlovely and unrighteous of people into his family. This really is the Messiah. And his history is shot through with the redemptive story. Whether it's Ruth, Tamar, Rahab or Bathsheba. And do you know what? He wants to set the record straight in your life. Where your history is dark and twisted and shame is present. Where you feel like you're the outsider longing to be welcomed in. The babe in the manger who was and is the light of the world can set your record straight and promise you this. And these are the words from Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, that your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. As I said at the beginning, maybe you've dialed into this not knowing what you're going to hear, how you're going to feel. Maybe you've had those controlling narratives over your life, narratives that you've wanted to break, you've wanted to set the record straight. Let God set the record straight in your life. Let him clean you up and welcome him, welcome you into his family this Christmas time and discover that this little babe, Jesus, is indeed the Lord and saviour of this world and he wants to be your lord and saviour too thank you so we're now going to have a short time of reflection as we listen to a song called his name sung to us by martha meager thank you to 
fantastic Christmas message. Thank you for that, John. And again, what a wonderful reflection song to have at the end. What greater thing could we possibly think of reflecting upon than the name of Jesus after a message like that? We're going to go into our final Christmas carol now, which is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So why don't you stand up in your living rooms and sing your hearts out as uh, we enjoy the final carol together.
Okay, so before we finish our service together today, we'd like to take a moment to pray together. So please, would you join with us in this brief time of reflection and prayer? If you don't know Jesus personally, or you're not used to the whole praying thing, just close your eyes and open your heart. Uh, let's join together and pray. Yeah, Father God, thank you, Lord God, for this Christmas time, Lord God, celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus, Lord God, and celebrating his incarnation, Lord God, the fact that he came, became one of us, Lord God, and uh, lived a life to show us who God is, Lord God, and, and died for us on the cross, Lord. Just thank you for this Christmas time and just pray uh, that you would keep us safe over this Christmas time, especially as families gather and friends gather, Lord God. Just pray that you keep us safe and healthy, Lord God, and, and, uh, but also we'd have some really good quality family time together, I pray, in Jesus' name. Father God, I want to thank you for the incredible generosity that we've witnessed across our city in how people have given to the food banks and particularly this Christmas and I'm sure other things too. Lord, I just really ask that you lead people and guide people who are really hungry this Christmas to the places where they can really receive food. I pray God that not one person would go hungry this Christmas. I just thank you, God, for the generosity in people's hearts towards that kind of giving. And I pray, God, that that would long continue as well, even after this pandemic has finished. Mm. But, Father, yeah, I just really ask that you uh, look after people this Christmas. And, Lord, as they feast on the food given to them by others, I pray that they would know that you, too, are a feast for us at Christmas. In Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Yeah, and we pray for this coming year, Lord God, for 2021, Lord God. I just pray that it might be a year of restoration, Lord God, for all those families, Lord God, that have really struggled financially this year, Lord God, for all those um, families that have lost uh, people, Lord God, during this year, Lord. Would you restore, Lord God, uh, your favour and your, your, your grace, Lord God, and just bring your comfort, Lord God, and just that 2021, uh, 2021 would be a really mm. uh, a, a year of blessing, Lord God, for, for, for all of us, Lord God, mm. um, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm. That just leaves me to say thank you for watching the service and I hope it's been a really special time for you as it has for us. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody from the Born Christian Centre who has helped to put this service together, all the kids, the families, the parents who have done the filming, all the technical people, Ben and Joe, John and Julia, Paul, just thank you so much for all the time that you've put into this service. Um, and just in case you were wondering why some of the kids suddenly aged, like part way through, it's because the readings at the beginning were taken from one of our services, our carol service actually, from last year. And we're going to have now another reading to end the service, a beautiful reading, prophetic reading from the book of Isaiah that was also recorded last year. So we're going to leave you with that before we have a very special treat just after that, which you're going to have to wait for. OK, Merry Christmas, Merry everyone. Merry Christmas. Yeah. And Happy New Year. Bye. Yeah, bye. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it of justice and righteousness. From that time on. And forever. forever.